So let's start recording here. And again, some of this going through the dermis and the, and the subcutaneous and a couple of things will be um, review because we did it in the lab. So and then we're going to get into some new stuff when we talk about nails and when we start talking about hair. Okay. So a couple things about the dermis. This is the, the deeper of the two layers. Okay. It is deep to the epidermis. Okay. Uh, whereas the epidermis was predominantly, or not predominantly, it was epithelial tissue, okay? The dermis is going to have all types of tissue, okay? Predominantly, it's going to be made up of connective tissue proper, all right? And if you remember, connective tissue proper is broken down into loose connective tissue and dense connective tissue. We'll get into the specifics of the, of the CT proper, all right, in a moment. But we see all the other stuff. Remember, this is the layer I told you where we see all the stuff in it, okay? You got blood vessels, sweat glands. That's the sweat glands are epithelial tissue, all right? Sebaceous glands, hair follicles, which is a derivative of the epidermis there, all right? Same thing with nail roots, nervous tissue, sensory nerve endings, and then muscle tissue, the erector pili muscle, okay? So we're going to see all this stuff in the dermis, all right? So there's two layers, the papillary layer, which is the more superficial of the two layers, and then we've got the reticular layer, and that's going to be the deeper of the two layers. Now we'll go down into more specifics here on this next slide here, okay? So the predominant connective tissue of the papillary layer is a loose connective tissue, and that's areolar connective tissue. And so something that you want to keep in mind, areolar connective tissue, all right, is loose, therefore it's going to be highly vascularized. So we're going to have some blood vessels in there, which is great. We want that because this layer is in close proximity to the epidermis. Epidermis is epithelial tissue. Epithelial tissue is avascular. It doesn't have its own blood supply. So we got to get a blood supply as close to it as possible. And we do that, all right, through this layer here. So when we see the papillary layer, it has these kind of bumps in it. And those are, you remember from lab, the dermal papillae. And up in those bumps, you'll see the nervous tissue. You'll have, uh, I was going to say Pacinian corpuscles, Meisner's corpuscles up there. But you'll also have um, blood vessels up in here. Okay, you can have some nervous tissue up in here, like the Meisner's corpuscles. All right. So what happens is they interlock with these structures right here. And these are the epidermal ridges. Okay, so what I'm kind of you know, kind of filling in here, that's, that's epidermis, that's epithelial tissue. And this configuration that we see here, this interlocking, all right, creates those friction ridges that we discussed, all right, your fingerprints, all right? And aside from being a great way to identify people, it's also those friction ridges actually make it a little bit easier for us to grasp things, okay? All right, the deeper of the two layers is the reticular layer. Okay, this is the larger of the two. This is the one that has, all right, predominantly, all right, the dense irregular connective tissue. It's a great test question there, all right? Dense irregular connective tissue is the predominant connective tissue found in the reticular layer. One of the things about dense irregular connective tissue is that it's, it's not as highly vascularized as areolar because it's a dense connective tissue. It will have less ground substance than the loose connective tissue, but it still has a decent amount of, of blood vessels there, okay? Which is important because of all the other items that we're gonna see in that area there, okay? We've seen this picture before, all right? But just to kind of give you an impression here, all right, you can see down here, deep here in the reticular layer, look at all the different things that we have. But most of this pink here is representing that dense irregular connective tissue. And we have some nervous tissue here, all right, with Pacinian or lamellated corpuscles, all right. We've got some hair follicles in here, muscle tissue, okay, and a bunch of glands here. And then you can see uh, spread out throughout is going to be some blood vessels there, okay? All right. We talked about this briefly in lab about the orientation of the collagen and the elastic fibers found in our dermis, okay? And they're in these bundles, and specifically, these bundles are in a parallel orientation to one another, right? Which is important, right? Because when you damage that tissue, and especially when we, when we were discussing about surgical incisions there, all right, it's important that we understand the orientation of these bundles of collagen and, and elastic 
Collagen is going to add strength and support and stability to that tissue. And then elastic fibers, well, that's going to help to give them that kind of resiliency to um, uh, different stresses and forces acted upon the, the skin. Okay, so like when you pull on the back, the skin on the back of your hand and you release it, it should rebound nicely and go back into its original shape. All right, but if you've ever seen in older people, like in their 70s and 80s, their skin can't do that as well. Okay, and that's because there's a decrease of collagen and elastic fibers. Well, anyways, these parallel bundles that we see in the skin, all right, are going to be important when we talk about this, the lines of cleavage here. These are these tension lines throughout the skin that it's important when a surgeon, especially if they're a plastic surgeon, okay, when they're going to be making incisions, surgical incisions, that they're aware of where these uh, parallel uh, bundles line up because if you make an incision perpendicular, all right, to those bundles, it'll take one longer to heal, the more likely you're going to have a greater amount of scar tissue. But if you make an incision parallel, all right, to those bundles, okay, then it'll be a much smaller incision, it'll heal faster, and you're less likely to have, all right, any type of excessive scar tissue there, okay? Weightlifters. Okay, if you've ever seen anybody that has been, I shouldn't say weightlifters, I made the mistake of saying that in my other section, bodybuilders, okay, people that usually want to gain a lot of muscle bulk, all right, and they want to do it relatively quickly, all right, but unfortunately, when you gain muscle bulk and you get that uh, muscle hypertrophy, the skin in most cases can't keep up with that, so it gets stretched beyond its normal capacity, all right, it needs to, and you've probably seen it in folks that have actually gained a lot of weight, and then rapidly lose the weight, all right? And yes, they'll have excessive skin or all the time. Some of it will get reabsorbed or resorbed, I should say, but a lot of that time they'll have some heavy skin, all right? But they'll also see stretch marks, and we refer to those stretch marks as striae. And it's because those collagen fibers were torn, all right, during that, that increase, that tissue hypertrophy, if it's muscles or if it's adipose tissue for folks that have lost a lot of body weight, okay? But usually it's because that skin was stretched beyond its, capabilities. It just couldn't handle it anymore. Okay? There's a certain, certain limit there. All right. The last tissue layer that we're going to talk about, which is not, make sure that you star this and circle this, it's not a part of the integument. All right. That's a great true false question. All right. That's the subcutaneous layer. And a lot of folks were answering hypodermis on uh, their lab tests, which is great. You know, it tells me that you use the different terms. I don't think anyone named it as superficial fascia, but that's fine. I don't, not too many people use that term anyway. All right. But again, it's not part of the integument, and it's made up primarily of loose connective tissue proper, specifically areolar and adipose. Adipose for energy storage. If you know the functions of adipose, then you know the functions of the subcutaneous layer, all right, because it predominantly has adipose tissue in it. So we know that adipose tissue is for energy storage. We also know that it helps to insulate Okay, folks that have a little bit more adipose tissue can withstand cooler temperatures a little bit better. All right, cushioning, okay, we'll find the adipose tissue on the, uh, in this layer here, all right, will help to cushion the underlying tissue structures, all right, and protection, okay. Areolar connective tissue is great because remember, that's the body's packing material, but it also gives us places to have blood vessels infiltrate that area, which is perfect. Because if we have energy storage, we need to liberate that energy and we need to get it out to other areas of the body. How do we do that? Through the circulatory system. And what is holding on to parts of the circulatory system? The areolar connective tissue, okay? So that's why we love to give, all right, drug injections into this area because of two things. One, it's highly vascularized, which is great. So we can get it out into the body. And two, it has a rapid rate of absorption. Adipose tissue is great like that. Okay? So you want to know that the two reasons why is extensive vascular network, which allows for us to have a rapid rate of absorption. All right? Also, same thing with intramuscular injections. If you've ever had to get a, a test booster, all right, or your DTAP booster, the one in your arm, the one that's always sore, I hate getting it off, right? Because I'm like sore for like three or four days afterward. But that's an intramuscular injection. All right, but muscles are highly vascularized, so it allows that the, the drug, or the vaccine in this case, to be spread throughout your body. It makes it quite effective. Okay. 
All right, now we're going to learn something new. Okay, now we're going to talk about nails. All right, we're not talking about getting a manicure and pedicure, although some of that's going to apply to this. So we're going to be bouncing back and forth between a couple slides here. I want to go over a couple things. One of my favorite, every chapter I usually have one favorite, yeah, I, that's a lie, more than one favorite like factoid that it's interesting to learn about in each of these systems. Well, one of my favorites for the skin is that nails are a modification of the stratum corneum. It's kind of cool. The outer layer of your skin, what I'm seeing, you know, on all of you, your stratum corneum, all right, your fingernails are just a modification of that, all right? Pretty cool. So we're going to find your nails on the ends of your fingers and your toes. And their job is to, one, protect those areas, but also it's going to help when you're trying to grasp something or, or, or pick at something, okay? It's much easier to pull a splinter out of your skin with longer fingernails than with no fingernails, okay? So let's go over a couple parts of the nail. And I'm going to go back and forth between this slide and another slide. All right, so we're going to go piece by piece so you get an idea of what I'm talking about. All right, the distal whitish edge here, the free edge, that's the part where you cut when you're doing your nails. So that's this part right here. So when you're clipping your fingernails, you're clipping off the free edge here. Okay, and it's white because there's no blood supply underneath it. Okay, you don't have a blood supply under there, so it's going to appear white. So the next part, the nail body, that's the part that you see at the tip of your finger that is pink. Okay, and that's because it has a blood supply underneath. The capillaries are right there. And then there's the part of the nail that you don't see, and that's the root of the nail. Similar to like the hair root, you don't see that because it's underneath your skin. All right, the nail root, this is the part that's underneath your skin here. And all three of these, the free edge, the nail body, and the nail roots, all three of them we refer to as the nail plate. Okay, so I'll pop over here, zoom in. All right, so here you can see, here's the whole nail. Has anyone here ever lost a nail? Drop something on your foot? Yeah, that's the whole nail plate that comes out. Boom, okay? I actually had a roommate in college, and I, uh, I was taking a sports medicine class. So it just so happened in that day in class, <clears throat> uh, we learned, you know, if you, for those of you who know this, if you drop something or, or, or bang, or you, like close the car door on your fingernail, you'll get blood trapped underneath the nail there. And it depends on how much can actually cause the nail uh, plate to disconnect from your finger. Well, his was, uh, I don't remember what he was doing. I want to say it was football related. And so there was a certain amount. It was pretty much all in this area here. Okay. And it was about half of the nail. So I said, man, you're going to lose that. That's gone. He was like, well, what can I do? I said, I got something we can do. So I took a needle because I'm going to tell you this right now, sewing needle, I'm awesome at sewing. I know how to sew, all right? There's something you guys didn't know about me. But I had one, and so I said, listen, I'm going to just take this, I'm going to heat it up with a lighter, I'm going to stick it into your nail. And what we're going to do is, once we stick it into the nail, the blood will squirt out. And that's what happened, and no lie. You had to do it quick, because as you know, blood, it, it coagulates, you know? And so when we did it, though, it was amazing. Because the blood did squirt out because it had nowhere to go except through that hole that we created. It, it did hurt. I'm not going to lie. Him, not me. And um, he, it, it drained that whole nail. He didn't lose the nail. But honest truth. Someone asked me last night, how come you didn't take the nail and slide it in between the nail and the tip of, of, the, of, the, of, of his toe? One, because the blood was all the way down here. So I would have had to go through live tissue. And, that, and that's a form of torture, bamboo under the fingernails. Have you guys ever heard of that? Yeah, it's, one, it's a very, very painful form of torture. <laughs> Anyways, yeah, that's, that was my college experience. But I, I was actually grateful that he let me do it. We both learned a lot about each other. Right All right, nail bed. Okay? This is what the nail sits on on your finger or toe. Okay? So it's going to be made up of the living portion of your epidermis. Okay? So that's all it is. So just think about like the nail bed, all right, is covered by the nail plate. The plate is like the sheet to your bed, okay? And your mattress is going to be like the nail bed, right? So it covers that whole portion. So you can see here, it's this pinkish area, all right, all the way here. Okay, that's your nail bed. 
and the nail plate sits right on top of that. All right, so we learned about briefly when we were going over in the lab for identification purposes. We remember the hair matrix, that was the active area where uh, epidermal cells, it's not say epidermal cells, epithelial cells were rapidly dividing so the hair would grow out. Well, in the same situation here with our nail, this is the actively growing part of the nail, okay? And of course, as you know, your nails push outward, okay? They go from the proximal portion of your finger to the distal portion. So essentially, they go from your knuckle out towards the tip of your finger, all right? So hence, that's why you have to cut your nails at the end of your finger and not the beginning of your finger, okay? So keep that in mind. That's the actively growing portion, all right? Lunula, with this structure here, I always think of the moon, all right? Luna, it's very similar in spelling, all right? But that's that whitest portion. So if you look on your fingernail, you can use your own nail, it's this whitest portion right here. And it's white because it's a thickened area of the epidermis. So you just, the, the pink, the capillaries underneath just don't show through, okay? Yes, ma'am. You know, it, it's, it just depends on how it's grown. Because in some cases, too, if you damage that area, too, you can actually kill, actually, I'd say kill some of the capillaries, but you can damage some of the capillaries so blood won't flow through there and it'll be a little bit bigger in some areas. That's one of the reasons. It just varies from individual to individual. Because I've noticed that about some of my fingers. I'm like, I can see it more on some fingers, but not as much on others. Yeah, that's a great question. <clears throat> Hold on. There we go. Nail folds. All right, we talked about pretty much uh, the proximal and distal portions of the nail, but we didn't talk about the lateral portions of the nail. And basically, the nail fold is where your skin actually folds up on either side of the nail bed there, okay? So, and it is here in these nail folds, too, where you got to be careful for the toes, ingrown toenails, all right? We'll talk about that in, uh, on, on a later slide here. All right, for folks that have ever gone and got uh, their nails done for manicures, pedicures, all right, this next part is the epiconium. It's known as the cuticle, all right? This is essentially where, all right, you have the epidermis from your skin or your finger lays on top of the nail body, all right? So this portion right here. All right, so you can see right here where it's just kind of laying on top there. From the skin here onto the nail body here, all right? That's going to be your cuticle. All right, and then the last part is the hypoconium. All right, this is at the very end of your finger, literally the free nail end. Will I accept cuticle on the test? No, no, no. Uh, well, for the lab test, you don't have to identify that, so you won't have to worry about that term. <laughs> but I want you to be aware of both. Um, for the hypoconium, again, this is where you'll see the free nail edge is gonna hang over the distal portion of your finger there, and right underneath that, all right, is the hypoconium. So if we look on this picture here, there's your hypoconium right here at the very end where the free nail edge hangs over right up here in the corner, that's your hypoconium, okay? So that's what causes nails? Not so much the hypoconium. It's usually in the lateral, uh, um, the, the lateral uh, folds there, where you get the ingrown toenails there. Um, and it varies depending. I mean, there's, you don't really get too many ingrown nails on fingers. It's usually on the feet. And there's varying reasons for that. One of which is wearing uh, inappropriate footwear, okay? like shoes that are really tight. Um, you'll see in athletes wearing cleats, especially soccer players. Uh, usually cleats are pretty form fitting. Um, could you go back? Yeah, I can go back one second. To this one right here, I'm assuming. No, 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 no worries. Okay, so um, nails are a really good indicator of, of health. You're very welcome, of health and nutrition. And the conditions of them, all right, if people usually have poor nutrition, for example, all right, it will eventually reflect in their nails. If their diet is garbage, all right, uh, they could have brittle nails, for example, all right. It used to be, if you've ever noticed, some of your fingernails will have white lines in some cases. Some of those are trauma marks, all right. 
but also some of those are from vitamin uh, C deficiency, not to the point where you're going to get scurvy. Okay, it's not that bad, right? but there, there is a deficiency there. So when we see brittle nails, the first thing you should be thinking of is that, the, that folks are not getting the proper type of nutrition. Also, always consider drugs. Okay, and I'm not saying illegal street drugs, I'm just talking about certain drugs, all right, prescribed drugs can cause that kind of thing. So in most cases when you, especially with hair loss, and we'll talk about this in a little bit, just always suggest, suggest suspect drugs somewhere along the way, all right, as a possible diagnosis, okay? Ingrown nails, again, seen it a lot of times, especially it's usually in the big toe, all right, uh, women are prone to it if they wear high heels and that the, sh the toe box is very narrow that it causes pinching of, of the nails there. And it can push that those lateral folds of the skin over onto the nail as it's growing out. It's a real pain in the rear end to take care of. Onchomycosis, fungal infection. Wash your feet, okay? Because fungus loves moist areas so basically if you're getting a foot a foot fungus and there's athlete's foot which is a certain type of bacteria uh, bacteria excuse me a certain type of fungus all right but when you get a toenail fungus the the fungus is underneath the toenail and it's happy there it loves to be there so when you get prescribed a medication for that does anyone happen to know the average length of time for a toenail fungus prescription 46 weeks try months six I'm months gonna, I'm gonna say six, to bring them in half. yeah six months minimum possibly up to a year that's how long it takes to take care of toenail fungus so it's no joke so if you ever suspect it and there's great drugs out there for it now trust me um they're in, they've come a long way it's, they used to use the topical creams and i can't remember the name of uh there was two big big market drugs that are out there. They're really good. Um, anyways, uh, yellow uh, nail syndrome. You'll see this in the older population, all right? So this is when toenails, all right? I keep saying toenails, but fingernails too. This is just the slowing of the growth here that we see, all right? So that's why you're going to see it in the older population. <clears throat> all right, normally when we look at our nails, all right, our nails are going to be convex. So they'll have this kind. If we're looking at it from the side, all right, it'll look like that. There's the free edge, and then here's your fingertip. Kind of coming off that. Okay. So when you get a spoon nail, the nail is concave, like that. Okay. Bowes line, this is something that I was describing to you earlier about uh, temporary interference with nail growth, and that's usually that can result from like trauma. Okay, something causes an issue there and it slows the nail growth there, and you'll see a white line there. Okay. And then vertical ridging. There's a good possibility that some of you might have vertical ridging. If you look and there's some ridges to your fingernail, it's, in most cases, it's just how your nail grows. There's no, it's not, you know, it's usually just something harmless and it's a pretty common situation. All right, let's talk about hair. Okay, hair is another epidermal derivative. Okay, it comes from the epidermis, all right, but usually what we'll see is it invaginates itself down into the dermis here. All right, so when we're talking about one single hair, which your textbook calls as, as a pilus, P I L L U S, pilus, all right, um, there's three zones to that the bulb, that's this big fat part at the bottom, okay, and then obviously the root, that's going to be the extension from the bulb all the way to the surface of the skin. And then you're going to have the shaft that comes out. Okay? So you need to know this, all right? When asked, okay, obviously we're pretty sure what we, that the hair bulb is the swelling at the base. And this is where we're going to get that active growing region there. All right? So this is, all right, well, you'll see the living epithelial cells in the bulb, in the root, and in the shaft. They're not living, they're dead. Okay? So the root is pretty much from the bulb all the way to the skin, okay? And then from the skin out to the outside world, that's going to be the shaft. All right, let's talk about a couple of the components here of our hair itself, all right, that's growing here. We're, we, should, we, we should be familiar with the hair matrix, okay? That's that part from down here in the bulb. 
Okay, and then you've got your hair papilla down here. That's the blood vessels that hang out here. And then just above it, right about here, in this region here, that's going to be your hair matrix. That's where we see those epithelial cells constantly dividing. And much like the epidermis, all right, when those cells were dividing in the stratum basal, where did the, the new cells go? They moved towards the surface, right? Well, that's what happens in the hair, okay? The new cells, all right, will be pushed towards the surface of the skin, okay? And that's how it works. And so obviously we all know that because we all have to get haircuts from time to time, all right, or shave our arms and legs or shave our faces, all right, because the hair is growing out of the skin. Okay, those are cells getting pushed towards the surface there, right? So the medulla, now you're going to see this term here, medulla and cortex, right? The common uh, pattern when we describe structures that have medulla and a, cor a cortex, the medulla is more of the central portion of whatever we're describing. And the adrenal gland, the center of the adrenal gland is called the medulla. And then the tissue that surrounds the medulla is the cortex. It's going to be similar here. I'll show you a picture and I'll come right back show you what I'm talking about so you don't think I'm pregnant. <clears throat> okay, so here you can see, all right, this brownish coloring here for our hair. That is going to be the medulla, right, the center portion of our hair. And then this tannish structure around the, 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 the brown portion that's the cortex. So it's similar to the adrenal gland. The adrenal gland is kind of like you've seen it before. It's like this globby looking thing that sits on top of the, the kidney. And at the center, all right, that's the medulla all right, for the adrenal gland. And then the cortex is the outer portion. So I'm teaching you a little bit of chapter 17 here. Same thing. All right, when we're talking about the hair. Okay, at the center of our hair, that's the medulla. And then this tannish portion that surrounds the medulla, that's the cortex. And then finally, this dark, thin, that looks brown to me, all right, line that surrounds the outer portion of the hair. That's what you're looking at. When you're looking at somebody, I'm looking at all your cuticles, all right? That's what I'm seeing of the hair. That's what the sebum from the, from the sebaceous gland is getting excreted onto, okay? It gets excreted onto the cuticle there, all right? That was a long explanation for this slide, okay? But I wanted to point that out to you folks. Okay, so when we're talking about the medulla, all right, that's the part that was made up of all those epithelial cells, so it's a remnant from the hair matrix there. And at this point, all right, it's going to be made up of, of a soft keratin. So it's going to have keratin that protect the protein, but it's going to be a little bit more flexible, all right? The cortex is the part of the hair that makes, that gives it its stiffness, all right? It makes it hard. Okay, so that's going to be more towards the outer portion or the outer hair surface there, All right? And then what kind of like a hot dog bun wrapping around a hot dog, the cuticle is going to surround the cortex there. And that's what we're seeing when we're looking at each other, okay? All right, you're familiar with these next two items, the hair follicle, All right? This is the structure that surrounds the hair root, okay? And it's, there's two portions to it. You have an outer portion to it and an inner portion. The outer portion is made up of connective tissue. Well, that's great because connective tissue is going to give that hair follicle its stability, its strength. Remember, connective tissue is usually its role is going to be stabilized or to support something, right, for the most part, okay? So that's what it does here, the outer portion. The inner portion, that's where we're going to see that epithelial tissue, okay? <clears throat> So one of the things that you definitely want to understand is, all right, that the outer portion, all right, it comes from the dermis, but the inner portion, it came from the epidermis. So during your development, this is more of an, embryolo an embryo embryology uh, uh, topic, but you're, you have your epidermis on the outside, and then I'm just going to use this as the dermis on the inside. Well, at one point, all right, parts of the epidermis just start to sink down into the dermis. It invaginates into that. Okay, and then it differentiates into certain tissues. Well, anyways, all right, the actual epithelial tissue that came from the epidermis is going to help to form the hair that grows out. And then the um, actual hair follicle portion, all right, that surrounds that, that's going to be made up of, uh, of dermis tissue, 
All right, and that's going to make up the connective tissue portion of that. This next structure is the erector pili. That's the soft, excuse me, that's the smooth muscle. Okay, and this is the smooth muscle that gives you goosebumps. I mean, it, it depends what source you're reading. It can also call it goose flash. Point being is it puts bumps on your skin. And the reason why is because the, the, the smooth muscle, meaning, remember, it's smooth muscle, so it's involuntary, right? You cannot consciously control that, all right? <clears throat> so it is going to stimulate that muscle to contract. And that muscle attaches from the hair follicle onto the dermal papilla here. So when it contracts, it pulls the hair follicle more upright, and it creates that bump on the skin there in which the hair is coming out of, okay? Part of that can be from um, certain sympathetic, because it's a sympathetic nervous system, a fight or flight response. But it could be if you're cold, right? It's a way to actually help with thermal regulation, right? But it also can be a reaction from a sympathetic type of stimuli, right? If you get chased by something, you can have that. If you get, I don't know, excited for Christmas morning to wake up and open up your presents, you can get uh, goose, uh, I was going to say goose pimples, goose pumps, all right? <clears throat> all right, so here's that picture we were looking at earlier. You want to understand that hair has a, a lot of functions that are similar to skin, okay? So we look at hair for protection. Well, what is that supposed to mean? Well, for someone like myself, it's great that I'm not bald because if I go out in the summertime, all right, and I spend more than a half an hour out there, if I didn't have hair on the top of my head, my scalp would get burned. So it's going to help to protect the underlying skin there from getting sunburned, all right? Facial expression all the time, all right? Eyebrows being raised, all right? <clears throat> Helps with understanding, and especially now when I'm looking out at you folks sitting in the classroom, I am very limited on to your facial expressions besides just what your eyes are doing. So I have to rely more on some of the uh, facial expressions involving the hair. All right, heat retention. That's what the goosebumps are for, right? For the hairs on your legs and on your arms, right? But also on the top of your head, all right? In the winter time, some people have a tendency to grow their hair longer. So they have more hair on their head to hold this, the heat in a little bit better. Sensory reception. It doesn't have to be a strong wind, but a slight breeze. Sometimes you'll feel it on your skin, all right, because it's moving the hair, and that hair is stimulating, all right, some of those tactile and sensory receptor cells in your epidermis and in your dermis. And so it's going to send sensory information to your brain and spinal cord. Visual identification. One of the ways that we're able to tell if somebody's, I hate to use this term, old, is that they have gray hair. Or white hair, even. Okay. That's not fair. That happens early. It does. It definitely does. It happened to my mother. <clears throat> um, so and my sister-in-law. She's in her twenties and she, half her hair is gray. <laughs> it's a genetic thing. And then chemical uh, uh, signal dispersal pheromones. All right. So usually around puberty time, you start to grow hair in your armpits and your groin area there, and you start to activate. We'll get into this into which glands start to get activated in puberty also. But those glands will start to create their secretions, and those secretions go out onto their, the pubic hair there, and, and the, mainly the axilla, the armpit region there. And then it'll get spread and, and give that person a certain scent. Sometimes that scent might be delightful. Sometimes that scent is offensive. All right? But regardless, we refer to that as pheromones. All right? <clears throat> all right, hair color. Um, I didn't get a chance to say this to you folks in this class, but in, in, in uh, I think the previous class, I mentioned that melanin gives your skin its certain pigmentation, but it also gives your hair its pigmentation, and it also gives the iris all right, of your eye its pigmentation, okay? So as your body or certain structures start to reduce the amount of melanin that they're producing, it will change the color of wherever we find that melanin, all right? So when your uh, hair starts to produce less melanin, it will go into a gray pigmentation, all right? And we, so, so when you see gray, it's a reduction in melanin production, okay? When you see white, that means there's no production of melanin, all right, in that structure, okay? 
So I don't know enough about this, but I'm a ginger. And so most gingers, I won't say all, but most gingers, all right, at least for males, um, their beard and in their hair, um, it, they won't be gray. It'll go straight white. So essentially, I don't have a beard now, um, but when I do, about half my beard is white. So basically, my hair and my face are quitters. All right, it's not something I'm proud of. It's something that I'm ashamed of. But at the same time, all right, it's one of those things that you one you to identify people. All right, with age. In my case, it's age. In some people, it's genetic. You know, but when you see white then there is no or complete stoppage of melanin production. When you see gray, it's a gradual reduction there, okay? All right, the three phases of hair growth. You just want to know all three of these because there's probably going to be a test question on it. All right, the first one, the antigen, that's the actual active phase, all right? Then the hair growth will slow down a little bit, and we call that the catagen phase, all right? And then there's going to be a, a short period of time where it doesn't grow at all. And that's the telogen phase. Just straight up memorization on those. Okay. I want to say on average, uh, hair grows. Let's say, and I can't remember. I don't think I have it in the slideshow. I can't remember if it's a third. It's a, it's three of something. It's either three millimeters a month or it's a third of an inch a month. And I cannot remember off the top of my head uh, what it is. But I know it's three is involved there somewhere. Okay. And I know that there's some folks, and it varies from person to person, obviously, okay? You probably know somebody whose hair that grows very fast. And that also is dependent on, one, nutrition, if they have a relatively healthy diet. If they're malnourished, their hair's not going to grow that fast because you don't have, the body doesn't have the ingredients that it needs for hair production. Same thing with nail growth, all right? There's going to be times <clears throat> when you might notice that your nails are growing much faster. It just varies from individual to individual. All right, hair loss, all right? So the general overall thinning of the hair, you've heard this term before because there's plenty of commercials that use this term, alopecia, all right? And alopecia is usually due to the aging process here. On average, you lose about 10 to 100 hairs per day. Now that's not off the top of your head, okay? That's gonna be your head, your arms, your eyebrows, anywhere there's, where there's hair, legs, okay? Back of your hands, that's, essentially what we're referring to, not just off the top of your head, okay? So when we're talking about alopecia, and especially when we're talking about just diffuse hair loss overall, again, you want to think drugs. If somebody comes in and they're talking about hair loss, like my hair is falling out of my head, you want to think drugs. What's another thing? It's not listed on here. Exactly, exactly. Stress, stress is a big uh, cause for uh, diffuse hair loss, right? Also, certain hormones are going to cause diffuse hair loss. Perfect example, people, mainly men, that abuse anabolic steroids, okay? That they'll actually see, even though they gain muscle mass, but they'll have a diffuse hair loss, all right? That's one of the side effects of anabolic steroid abuse, all right? But when we see diffuse hair loss, we mainly see it in women. Okay, iron deficiency also plays a role in that. All right, male pattern baldness, all right, that's when basically the top of the head is bald, and then there's hair on the sides and around the back. Okay, and a big component of that is going to be genetics and hormonal. When we talk about hormonal, um, there's some research that's out there that says that there's actual testosterone receptors in certain hair follicles, and as you decrease the testosterone production, Therefore, you don't stimulate those hair follicles anymore, and that's why they stop producing hair. Right? Again, it's not conclusive, but they're still looking into it. And then there's hertuism, right? This is excessive male pattern hairiness. Hairy arms, legs, possibly even uh, uh, facial hair, okay? You'll see hertuism in females predominantly, okay? And it's usually in some women that have polycystic ovarian uh, syndrome, okay? And that, for whatever reason, causes hertuism. An easy way to treat that, birth control. Just give them birth control. And that will up the uh, uh, estrogen progesterone, downregulate any testosterone production, and boom. <clears throat> okay.
Questions so far? Am I recording this? I'm just kidding. I'm recording. <laughs> sir, yes, sir. Yeah, I would eat my lunch. <laughs> all right. Let's talk about exocrine glands. All right. We talked about this a little bit before. All right. But a couple things I want to get into. First of all, we have our generalized sweat glands, which is made up of these two, the maracrine and apocrine. We saw that. And then we have our sebaceous glands. All right. So there's three types. What's an exocrine gland, by the way? It has ducts. That's right. It has ducts. Okay. Then the endocrine glands does not. So exocrine glands emit its secretions into the ducts, and the endocrine glands have to emit its secretions into the interstitial tissue fluid or into the blood supply that might be close by. Yes, ma'am. Is endocrine like hormones? Mm -hmm. Straight up, yep. Um, you're gonna, your ovaries, uh, uh, the, tes the, the testicles, uh, the medulla, or the medulla. On your adrenal glands, thyroid glands. Your pancreas is actually uh, the only organ that is both. It's an exocrine and it's an endocrine gland. Okay? Kind of cool. All right. So we saw the American sweat glands before. Okay? These are by far the most numerous type of sweat gland in your body, and it's throughout your whole body. And so essentially, it's going to emit its secretions onto the epithelial surface. And in this case, that epithelial surface is going to be the skin surface. All right. So we talked about how it gets rid of its secretions. It does it through the process of exocytosis. And I'm going to assume that you all are pretty well read and understand what exocytosis is. But if you don't, remember, real easy, EX exits. So the secretion is going to exit the cell, and how it does that is by the cell makes a secretory vesicle inside, it packages up the secretion, it sends it to the plasma membrane, that secretory vesicle fuses with the plasma membrane, and it spits its secretions out, outside the cell, okay? So we call the secretion sweat. So the majority of sweat, 99% of it, in fact, is water. The other 1% is going to be the other chemicals, like Metabolic waste, urea, for example, okay? I don't know if you've ever heard this before, but your sweat is just, not completely, but it's a diluted form of urine, okay? Because there's urea, all right, in your sweat, but also there's lots of water too, all right? You also have electrolytes, okay? Electrolytes are going to be what? Salts, like charged particles of salt, you know, sodium, potassium, chloride, all right? If you've ever... Not saying go around licking yourself, but if you've ever tasted your sweats, if you've been sweating so much and it drips onto your lips and you lick your lips or whatever and it's salty, that's because of the sodium chloride that's being emitted there. All right. You'll also have other metabolites there. So as we know, all the way back from chapter one, the role that your sweat glands play in thermal regulation. Remember, we saw the example of the guy chopping wood. Okay, and so his body temperature increased. So his Hypothalamus then upregulated, all right, the functionality of his blood vessels, all right, and it stimulated the sweat glands to emit sweat. And once that sweat evaporates off your skin, it gives you a cooling effect. And at the same time, you get vasodilation of the blood vessels in your skin, letting more heat off of your body. But the main purpose for our sweat is that evaporation uh, phenomenon. All right, apocrine glands. All right, this is when AP, the apex of, uh, or the apical surface of the cell itself pinches off, okay? So in this situation with the apocrine glands, you're going to, one, associate these glands with area where there's hair. And I want you to think specifically pubic hair, okay? So that's going to be hair found in your armpit, the axilla. You don't get that until you hit puberty. Same with the nipples. Same with your pubic area and the anal area there, all right? All that, those spots, all right, are not really going to have hair growth until puberty. So therefore, these glands do not become active until puberty, okay? Same type of situation. These glands, all right, secrete their product through that process of exocytosis, but in addition, the top of the gland, or excuse me, the top of the cell, the, ap the apical uh, portion of the cell pinches off. So therefore, 
all right, the glandular secretions are going to be thicker, more viscous, all right, more cloudy. And because we already know what, what is, um, what macromolecules make up the plasma membrane? Right, lipids and proteins, okay? And that's what we see here. These secretions, in addition to whatever they're secreting, all right, but because it's pinching off the plasma membrane, we're going to get additional proteins and lipids, all right? And guess what? Bacteria love to eat on that stuff. They love it. They love carbohydrates, too. Don't get me wrong. But here's what happens when somebody starts to sweat and they stink, okay? And now, sometimes it can be because of their, their, their pheromones. But at the same time, what will happen is you have bacteria, we all know, growing on our skin. It lives there. It loves to be there, all right? So especially in the moist areas, which are going to be armpits, pubic area, the anal region, all right? You're going to have bacteria in those areas. So when you start to sweat through these glands here, all right, you're going to be emitting those proteins and those lipids onto the hair there. Well, there's bacteria there, so they're going to start to utilize and metabolize those proteins, those lipids, and as a byproduct, much like we do, all right, and our cells, we're going to have waste products. The bacteria have the waste products, and it's that bacteria uh, waste products that creates the stinky odor. So now you know. And so that's why for any of you that have teenage sons like I do, I'm always telling them to take a shower because it stinks. <laughs> All right, so keep in mind, these glands do not start working until puberty. So just in your mind, if you're trying to learn where these are found, just think in areas that are going to see hair growth during puberty, okay? All right, the last type of gland, all right, are holocrine glands. These are the holocaust glands. These are the ones that disintegrate, they self-destruct, all right? The whole cell itself just breaks down, okay? So it's going to make a very thick secretion. We call that sebum, okay? And we'll see it, all right, that it's going to be emitted onto the hair. But as that hair is erupting out of the skin, it's also going to get onto the, uh, onto the skin there, all right? What I love about sebum is that it has this property here. It's bactericidal. Cool. Kills off bacteria. You could use that, especially when you're in puberty, all right, and you get acne, all right? And we found that there are certain antibiotics that help great with acne, but your body also makes its own form of antibiotic, all right, sebum here, okay? So this hormone, excuse me, this gland becomes active when we see hormone production occur, usually during puberty, but our sex hormones, the androgens there. Okay, so again, this is another gland that becomes activated during puberty, thanks to the hormone production that occurs, namely androgens, okay, sex hormones. You guys seeing this? Am I, oh, am I going slow enough or am I going too fast? I can slow down. Some of this stuff I know we've gone over before. I just, again, don't, don't hesitate. Don't hesitate. Okay. Whoops, I didn't want to do that. All right. Two other types of glands. All right. And we talked about these also in lab. The ceruminous glands, these are going to be the glands that make your ear wax, which is called cerumen. All right. So again, they're a modified apocrine gland. We're going to see them in our external ear canal, hence that's why when you stick uh, a Q-tip up there, all right, you're going to be getting rid of, or hopefully you won't be impacting your ear canal with uh, a cerumen, but um, you're going to see this in the external ear canal. Its job is to trap foreign material, but what we don't realize and talk about as much is that it helps lubricate the tympanic membrane or your eardrum. Your eardrum, all right, it's important that it stays lubricated. Okay, because it's often, it's like a tambourine uh, or a drum set. If you've ever played drums, all right, especially, um, I should rephrase that. Um, if you've ever played like the bongos, okay, or uh, the, the hand drums, 
All right, a lot of that material is made up of a certain type of animal hide, and you have to lubricate the animal hide, otherwise it dries out and gets damaged. Same thing here with your tympanic membrane, your eardrum. I lived in the Caribbean for many years, and I had a roommate, and we were living down there. And the island that we lived on, it wasn't uh, the, the island that you would go to on vacation if you wanted to stay at a resort. I don't think there was any resorts on that island at the time. It's one of the poorer islands. But anyways, um, my one roommate, he was terrified. Uh, what is modified in these glands? Um, the apric what, what do you mean by what is modified? The actual, are you talking about the secretion you mean? Oh, actually what, what, uh, yeah, right. Okay. I see what you're saying. Yeah. With the, with the modified apocrine gland, all right, it is pretty much obviously going to be the apical area there. But in addition to that, you'll see some of the organelles that are also being um, secreted out. <clears throat> but you got it. So my roommate decided that he wasn't going to clean his ears out. He said the reason why is because there's a certain population of certain insects on this island, and he was terrified that they were going to crawl into his ear. And especially he was one of those folks that uh, had read one too many articles on spiders. They say that, I think, I don't know if it's true or not, but it's like, what, five or ten spiders crawl into your ears every year or something like that? Have you guys heard that? Okay. So for the whole three years that while he was there, he never cleaned. I know, I know. Uh, but for the whole three years that he was there, he never, ever cleaned his ears. And at the same time, he never had any of the bugs crawl into his ears, so I guess it worked. All right. Memory glands. Okay. We talked about this. These same type of situation, these glands will not become active until there's a certain stimulus and it's that stimulus all right for the memory glands is usually going to be childbirth okay so it depends on two hormones oxytocin and prolactin all right the prolactin will start to be produced um, before uh, childbirth and oxytocin obviously is going to be produced during childbirth and then it also is being produced um, after childbirth for milk ejection okay all right. Let's in that one. All right. Let's talk about how skin is repaired. Okay. We're almost done here. All right. So the first thing that you want to understand is the difference between these two terms here, regeneration and fibrosis. All right. Because when you damage your skin, it can be repaired in two ways. All right. In one of two ways, actually. Okay. Regeneration, which is the ideal one, all right? Fibrosis is the non-ideal one, okay? So what will happen is with regeneration, you damage some tissue, no problem. That damaged tissue gets swept away, and then you regrow new tissue in that area, and everything goes back to normal, okay? So that's what happens here. We're going to replace whatever was damaged or dead, but this is the important part. We restore organ function, okay? Now, what that means is if they were cells that were had a, a, a secretory function, they were secreting stuff, okay? When we repaired those cells or, or replaced them, okay, those new cells were able to secrete, okay? That is what we mean by restoring organ function. With fibrosis, right, we don't get that, okay? So here's what happened. The area that was damaged, all right, usually there's a gap, and I'll show you an example here in a second, all right? And that gap is going to be replaced with scar tissue, okay? And that scar tissue is collagen. And you want to know what makes the collagen. Fibroblasts. You should have already known that, but just to remind you. So fibroblasts will be called to the scene anytime you cut your skin open. Be it a paper cut, all right? Be it a deep cut where you're bleeding, fibroblasts will be called to the scene because they're going to lay down some collagen there, all right? Now, collagen doesn't always mean it's going to have scar tissue. If you get a lot of collagen, most likely you will have scar tissue. If you get very minimal, all right, that's okay. But what happens is, all right, organ function is not, and I repeat, is not restored. That's important. With regeneration, everything's good. Fibrosis, not so good. So, like, when you get a tattoo, um, 
like that's like permanently like I guess scar your skin, right? So would it what would would it be regeneration that does or fun? Well, for the most part, now it depends on what how deep the, with the tattoo, but you should have sensation restored to that area there. All right. Um, so you will have, I mean, it's not so much regeneration, it's all they're doing is taking an ink and they're actually um, transmitting it underneath the epidermis there. So it'll, you know, usually stay kind of. So like you get like a backyard one, you know, off this peasant. Like a brand, <laughs> like if you burn yourself, you know? <laughs> yeah, then that's going to be fibrosis. Yeah. <laughs> Right, right, yeah, that, that will definitely come into play. And again, a lot of times it depends on how deep the wound is, all right, or the incision is going to be, you know, what layers that you're going through. Because you already know that the epidermis, I mean, really the only functional cells that are going to be there aside from, you know, those tactile cells, all right, are going to be, I won't, I'm not going to include the dendritic cells, those should be fine, but the keratinocytes. And so it's usually when you get down into the dermis, depending on how deep that incision is, right. Yeah, I mean, if you start to damage, and especially when you start to mess, when you're dealing with blood vessels, then, then you're just going to start bringing in a bunch of cells. And there's a phenomenon called a keloid scar. Has anyone ever heard of that? And certain people, like for me, for whatever reason, I keloid. I don't know why, but I, my scar tissue has a tendency to, to overreact. And certain people will have the same uh, uh, genetic thing, I believe. Um, so, and it usually has to do with, one, the amount of blood supply going to that area, the incision type, and what will happen, it's, it, it's basically an over-exuberant, uh, uh, um, what's the word I want to use, uh, plethora of fibroblasts that come to an area there. So there are some factors that do play in, 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 into that role for first and second. Um, but really, like, let me show you this example here, and that might help you out here a little bit. This, oops. Let's go into the stages of wound healing, and then hopefully this will answer your question a little bit better. Okay, so I'm going to go one by one. I'm going to do stage one, and then we'll go over here to the picture. Okay, so here's what happens. The first part of, of, of a wound is you damage the skin, all right, and you damage blood vessels. So that means you've gone past the epidermis, and you're into the dermis, okay? Well, that's what we see here, all right? We see, all right, whoops. We see, all right, you have a cut, a puncture wound, whatever. It's penetrated through the epidermis and down here into the dermis, okay? And we have some blood vessels that were damaged. So obviously, and you're going to get into this in more detail, trust me, um, in 2.11. I'm just going to hit the basic stuff. But if you understand this stuff here, when you get more into, you know, leukocytes, and white blood cells, and, and, and prostaglandin infiltration, you know, and I know it sounds like a lot, but you'll have a better understanding in, in 211. So we damage the blood vessels, and now blood starts to fill in the area here. Okay? And blood, as you know, carries our blood form elements. Red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets. Platelets do what? Platelets. Clot. They clot the blood. Okay? So we see here in our second, in the second stage here, all right, the blood will start to clot. Again, you'll go into more detail next semester. Um, but that is from, all right, your, your platelets actually slowing down the flow of blood there, all right? But also, those blood vessels will start to vasoconstrict, and so they too will start to slow down what's coming in there. But the important thing is you get your white blood cells, the leukocytes, they come in, and they start to clean out the wound because obviously there's going to be foreign bacteria Four invaders that are going to get in there. So the important thing is, is that blood clot is only a temporary barrier right now. Because our goal is to do damage control and, and make sure that we're not getting pathogens just entering into your body at, at their leisure. Okay? So here, all right, our blood starts to clot and it seals off the external environment. So now, all right, your tissue can start to work on the area by itself. So the white blood cells that enter into there will be macrophages, right? Remember those are the Pac-Man cells. They go around and they gobble up, right? Cell debris, damaged debris, damaged tissues and cells. So they'll start going around and cleaning that up and eating that up, 
if there's any bacteria, any viruses or anything, helps to go around and eat that up. Amongst other tissues like lymphocytes and then the neutrophils, so just white blood cells right now are going to start to go in here and start to clean out the area. Fibroblasts now start to get in here, and they're going to start to lay down the collagen. Okay. Now, one of the problems is, and this goes on to your question about second and, and, and first and second degree, um, what were you saying? The first and second degree. Um, <laughs> yeah. Collagen fibers, and this kind of goes back with the lines of tension, but collagen fibers, what you'll find out is if they lay their fibers down parallel to the existing collagen there, you'll minimize your scar tissue formation. All right. But that also has to determine how big the wound is. You know, if it's a, I don't want to say a paper cut, but if it's like a paper cut incision, that's even smaller than a scalpel incision, hardly anything. But if it's where, you know, a chunk of metal flew into you, that's going to be a different story there. So we're going to get the fibroblasts, and they're going to start to lay the collagen down in that area. Okay? So now what's going to happen is, now we got the bleeding stopped, all right? Now we had that damaged blood vessel. We have to repair that. So we're going to grow either new blood vessels or repair that already damaged blood vessel. And now we're going to start to create what's called granulation tissue. And that's like your scar tissue. Okay, so that collagen fibers are being laid down, all right, coming back over here, you can see, all right, now we start to recede back this area here, but all this is just fibroblasts, and they're hard at work laying down collagen, and at the same time, we're going to try to unite these damaged blood vessels. Now, you'll get some smaller blood vessels up here that's called neovascularization, that's when we get these small blood vessels to bring uh, the blood form elements into this area here. Eventually, those can either stay or they'll be resorbed and, and destroyed because we don't need them anymore. But again, we try to repair what was severed here if we can. If not, because car scar tissue's gotten in the way, then it's no big deal. We'll just grow new blood vessels in other areas so we can make sure the tissue can still have that. Okay? So then finally, in our last stage here, all right, now we're going to get whatever epithelial tissue that was damaged in the epidermis, all right, as long as we can reestablish that stratum basale level there, then we can start to grow that epithelial tissue back out. And eventually that scab, that blood clot, will just flake off unless you pick it off, okay? So and that's the, the final stage here, all right? Again, there's more detail to this, but for our purposes right now, we're just going to hit you with the mineral stuff. Okay. So you can see, all right, we've got these new blood vessels, but they've kind of retracted because we no longer need to worry about that because we've regrown our epidermis here. And then you've got your scab here, which will eventually flake off. And then these, these cells, these new cells will push out and push out, and eventually that tissue will um, be brand new. Okay. So it all depends really on how bad the damage is, how much scar tissue is formed, and determining all right, um, uh, the amount of fibrosis that occurs and how much organ function is lost. All right, burns real fast, okay? Different types of burns, I'm sure you're very familiar with it. A lot of it, obviously, we're familiar with, you know, burns from a fire, but we can get chemical burns, heat radiation burns. That was a big fear back in the 70s when we had a lot of um, nuclear plants being built in the country, all right? Electrical shock burns. Has anyone ever been electrocuted? Have you? Did you get uh, any significant burns or just shock? Uh, slight burns. Okay. Definitely like connected water with like the fire. Okay. Did you lose? Did, did it knock you out? <laughs> no, but no. I screamed. Okay. <laughs> I got stung by a jellyfish. Is that like? That's a burn? chemical. Yeah, just because yeah. of the chemical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's awful. <clears throat> well, you know how you. Treat a, a jellyfish thing, right? No, you don't. <laughs> <laughs> That's the opposite of what you want to do. White vinegar. Okay, we can do that. <laughs> All right. So, anyways, the big concern that we have when it comes to burns is dehydration and infections. Those are the two big concerns when we're talking about any type of burn. Usually, the more serious ones. Obviously, third degree is, you know the worst type of burn that we're going to be discussing today, okay? But the first degree, I remember it like this. 
First degree burns are only going to involve the first layer of your skin, which is the epidermis. All right. So when you get that's like something touching something hot for a moment, right? You burn yourself. You're like, dang. All right. Well, of course you're going to have pain involved, and that area that you touch will have some redness to it. Okay. So how do we treat that? Put your finger in your mouth. No. You run cold water on whatever it was burned. Okay. The second type of burn is the second degree burn. Okay. So how I remember this one is. It affects two layers, okay? It's gonna definitely uh, affect the epidermis, okay? But then it's gonna affect part of the dermis. But regardless, if it's part or all of it, it's still two areas, okay? So this is the type in which you have actually get a blister, okay? So you've actually, again, it's gonna be painful, but now you've actually caused, all right, enough damage to that area where you're gonna get protein infiltration because that's what the exudate is that's the fluid in the blister it's just a bunch of proteins with some blood plasma there all right so that's where you start to get the blistering now you can get scarring from that all right i've had that before i was wearing tiva sandals one summer and i didn't put sunblock and this is how i learned my lesson you put sunblock on the top of your feet all right when you're outside for several hours um and i got second degree burns on the top just because i was an idiot all right Third degree, this is all three layers, epidermis, dermis, and subcutaneous layer. This is where these people end up in the hospital, all right? And they're being treated for the two big concerns, dehydration and an infection, okay? And this is gonna, depending on how bad it is for third degree and how much, it's going to involve skin grafts, okay? And basically what they'll do, they call it the rule of nines. They'll assess the area and then they break your body up into nine specific areas there. And then depending on how many of those nine areas are affected, will determine the severity of your overall burns there. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So how do we treat it? First thing is treat for fluid loss, dehydration. Okay. You need to rehydrate them. So you make sure that the caloric, the caloric intake of whatever they're taking, but you can also hang an IV bag on them, make sure that they're going to not become dehydrated, all right? And then we treat them for the pain, obviously. And then because it's an injury, and any type of injury is going to involve the stages of healing, and the first stage of healing is inflammation, then we're going to treat for that inflammation, okay? Depending on how bad it is, all right, third degree burns, they call it debridement. That's when they get rid of the dead tissue. You get rid of the dead tissue, it's going to allow the new tissue to grow in without any hindrance, and it's not going to be impeded. Obviously, you want to control the infection because when you've lost what's one of the functions of skin, protection. It protects us from the external environment, and the external environment is loaded with microorganisms that want to kill us and hurt us, all right? So we want to make sure that we're controlling the infection. And at the same time, we want to increase the caloric intake because when the skin is healing, it's undergoing metabolism. So just like anything else, you know, metabolism requires energy. So we need to make sure that we're giving it energy through our increased caloric intake. There. All right. Now, as with every chapter from here on out, for the most part, we're going to talk about the effects of aging on whatever system that we're going to talk about okay so we talked briefly about some of the effects of aging on the skin because we talked about its effect on the epi, uh, what it does with epithelium okay first of all all right remember the general rule of aging is everything slows down okay so the rate of growth the rate of cell uh, uh reproduction it all slows down so not only do we lose a number all right of stem cells but whatever those stem cells do, the activity of those stem cells decreases. So our skin repair, all right, slows down. And over time, the skin becomes thin, okay, because everything is regenerating at a much slower rate, all right? And because it's thinner, it makes us more prone to trauma, all right? We talked about the, the cells that produce collagen, the fibroblasts, well, fibroblast cell number decreases and their activity slows down, so we'll have fewer or less collagen. Same thing with elastic fibers, all right? The existing elastic fibers lose their ability to stretch and recoil, all right? So we'll start to see wrinkles here, 
all right, in areas where they're called crow's feet around the eyes there and uh, wrinkles in the forehead, right? Fewer dendritic cells means our immune ability in certain layers of the skin becomes compromised. And then over time, all right, the hair follicles are producing, all right, a, a small, I shouldn't say a smaller, but a thinner hair, all right? So overall, our hair start has a tendency to thin or the hair follicles just give up and stop growing hair, so you have no hair, all right? So just keep in mind that general rule is everything slows down, all right, as we get older. So which brings me to this, ultraviolet radiation and the effects that it has on skin. Okay, which brings me to talk about the most common type of cancer, five times more common than any other type of cancer. Skin cancer is five times more common than prostate cancer in men, and it's five times more common than breast cancer in women. Okay, so we have to be very careful with that. And usually, a big factor for skin cancer is UV radiation. Okay because it damages the DNA in our cells. Right? So as we get older and the skin becomes thinner, we have to be very careful with that because we have fewer, as you saw on the previous page, we have fewer dendritic cells, and it's those dendritic cells that are constantly monitoring the cells in your epidermis, okay? And so if there's fewer immune cells, then skin cancer has more of a likelihood to actually occur, okay? So because ultraviolet radiation hits areas that are exposed to the sun, top of the head, top of the ears, back of the neck, any area that's going to be consistently and constantly exposed to the sun. So you want to keep that in mind. Obviously, if you're like me, you're a fair-skinned individual, right, your risk is much higher. All right, this part here we've already talked about, so this is just a, a review here. So I'm not even going to go over that. We have all those notes. So that's the functions of the integument. That is the skin. How do you guys feel after the skin? Good? I like it better than cells. I went to get the bones. Bones are going to be fun. Bones and, and joints are actually pretty good too. Joints are, um, that's way <laughs> better than cells. Yeah, no, I know, I know. Yeah, yeah. Well, and from this point on, um, good, I'm glad. I'm glad the refresher helped you out. Um, from this point on, um, you guys are going. We're going into systems now. All right, we're going to do the skeletal system next. You guys, I see you guys. We y'all. I'm in the south, so I got to use y'all. Um, we get to learn about the skeleton, and you're going to learn a lot of things that you didn't realize uh, about bones. All right, we're going to learn how the bones grow and how the, the, these cells, the cartilage cells, um, what they start to actually how they um, reproduce and whatnot, um, and then. Muscle cells, nervous cells, we're getting some really interesting stuff. So the kind of the, I don't want to call it the minutia, but the real small um, um, organizational systems are kind of out of the way now. Now we get to go on and, and, and explore some other stuff. So let's take a break. Um, this is a good time to take a break. And what we'll do is um, give you about 15 minutes, and then we'll meet back here, and um, we'll finish up the spine and then we will uh